I remember the night Tom left. It wasn't like any other evening, though everything started out just the same. I was sitting on the edge of the bed, staring at my reflection in the dresser mirror. My hair was still damp from the shower, and I couldn't bring myself to meet my own eyes. That's the funny thing about guilt. It's always there, creeping up on you in the quiet moments, catching you when you're most vulnerable. Tom stood in the doorway, his face unreadable, like a stone statue. I didn't have to ask if he knew. He knew. I could feel it in the air, thick with the weight of unspoken truths. We had been married for over forty years, and in that time we had become experts in silence, avoiding the difficult conversations, sidestepping the cracks in our lives. But this silence was different. It was final. He didn't raise his voice. He didn't need to. His words were slow, deliberate, and they cut deeper than any scream ever could. I'm leaving, Linda, he said, his eyes colder than I'd ever seen them. You'll never see me again, but this, this isn't over for you. He walked out that night without so much as a backward glance. No packed bags, no slamming doors. Just a chilling goodbye that left me frozen in place, my heart hammering in my chest as his footsteps grew softer and softer down the hall. That was the last time I saw him. For weeks, I waited. At first I told myself he needed space, time to cool off. Maybe he'd come back and we'd talk things through, even if I wasn't sure what there was left to say. But as the days passed, the dread settled in. He wasn't coming back, and that was when the fear took hold. Fear of what I'd done, fear of what he was capable of. You see, I didn't just lose my husband that night— I lost control of everything, my life, my sanity, my sense of who I was. Tom's absence was like a shadow that followed me everywhere, darkening every corner of my mind. And the worst part was, I knew this was only the beginning. His final words echoed in my mind over and over, This isn't over for you. He was right. It wasn't over, not by a long shot. I thought the affair was the worst thing I could have done, but I was wrong. So, so wrong. It was only a spark, a small fire that I thought would burn out quickly. But now, as I sit here alone in this empty house, I see the flames have spread, consuming everything in their path. And the person I have to thank for all of this, myself. And perhaps Tom... But there's one thing I know for sure. Wherever Tom is, he's still out there, watching, waiting. And I'm left here, haunted by the last thing he said to me. When I think back to how it all began, I can't pinpoint an exact moment. It wasn't as though I woke up one day and decided to throw everything away. My marriage, my dignity, my peace of mind. It happened slowly, in the smallest, most unnoticeable ways. A smile that lingered too long, a conversation that felt too personal, and then, before I knew it, I was standing on the edge of a cliff, ready to jump. It all started at the gym. After I retired from teaching, I found myself restless. My days, once filled with the energy of children and the hustle of lesson plans, were now endless stretches of quiet. Tom, being older, had already retired from his job as a security consultant, but he was always busy with his own hobbies, fishing, reading military history, or tinkering with things in the garage. We didn't spend much time together anymore, not like we used to. So I joined a local fitness center, more for the routine than anything else. That's where I met Ryan. He was a personal trainer, young, so much younger than me, charming, and always with a smile that made you feel like you were the only person in the room. He had that kind of energy that was contagious. I hadn't felt that alive in years. At first, it was innocent. I'd see him at the gym, we'd chat between sets, and he'd give me advice on my routine. I knew he flirted with all the women who came in, especially the older ones like me. It was harmless, or at least I told myself it was. But then things started to shift. I looked forward to our conversations more than I should have. 
I'd catch myself thinking about him outside of the gym, wondering what he was doing if he thought about me. And when he started complimenting me, telling me I didn't look my age, that I was more interesting than the girls his age, it did something to me. It made me feel seen. Tom had stopped seeing me years ago. We were still together, of course, but we weren't really together. We moved around each other in the house like ghosts, passing through the same spaces, but never really connecting. He was always buried in his books or his projects, and I felt more like his roommate than his wife. Ryan made me feel young again, desirable, like I still had something to offer. The night it happened was like any other night. I had been going to the gym regularly for months by then, and Ryan and I had developed a routine of talking after my sessions. He'd offer me a protein shake, and we'd sit in the back office chatting about life. That night, I remember feeling particularly lonely. Tom had been away for a work conference, and the house had felt especially empty. Ryan asked if I wanted to grab a drink after the gym, and without thinking, I said yes. I knew, deep down, that it was a bad idea, but I ignored the warning bells in my head. We went to a small bar near the gym, had a few drinks, and before I knew it, we were sitting in his car, parked in a quiet lot. I wish I could say it was a whirlwind of passion, that it swept me off my feet and made me forget the world for a moment. But the truth is, it was clumsy, awkward, and filled with regret, even as it was happening. It wasn't love. It wasn't even lust, not really. It was just two people filling a void, grasping for something they didn't have. Afterward, I felt sick. I couldn't look at him, couldn't even speak. Ryan didn't seem to notice, or maybe he just didn't care. He kissed me on the cheek and told me he'd see me at the gym the next day. I sat in my car for a long time before I drove home, my hands shaking on the steering wheel. That night, I lay in bed next to Tom, who had returned from his trip, staring at the ceiling. I felt like a stranger in my own skin. The guilt gnawed at me, but I told myself it was a one-time mistake, a lapse in judgment that would never happen again. I convinced myself that I could bury it, that no one had to know. But secrets have a way of creeping into the light, no matter how hard you try to keep them hidden. And in the end, it wasn't me who brought the truth out into the open. It was Tom. I never imagined Tom would find out. I thought I'd been careful, covering my tracks, deleting messages, keeping things discreet. But Tom was smarter than I gave him credit for. He always had been. After years in the military and his work in security, he had a mind that was sharp, always watching, always observing. I should have known better. The confrontation happened on a rainy Saturday afternoon, a few weeks after the night with Ryan. I had been living in a state of denial, telling myself that everything would go back to normal, that the guilt would fade, and I could forget it ever happened. But I was wrong. I was in the kitchen, making tea when Tom walked in. He was quiet, too quiet, and there was something in his eyes that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. He didn't say anything at first, just watched me as I went about my task. The tension in the room was suffocating. Finally, he spoke. Linda, we need to talk. I froze. My hands were shaking, and I had to set the kettle down before I dropped it. I turned to face him, trying to keep my voice steady. What's wrong? He didn't answer right away. Instead, he reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. My heart sank. He unlocked the screen and held it out to me, his expression unreadable. I took the phone, my stomach churning, as I looked down at the message on the screen. It was from Ryan, a simple stupid text that I hadn't deleted, one I had forgotten about. It wasn't even explicit, just a casual message about meeting up at the gym. But Tom wasn't a fool. He didn't need to see more to understand what had happened. Care to explain? he asked, his voice low and steady. I couldn't speak. My throat felt like it was closing up and the room seemed to spin around me. 
I opened my mouth to say something, anything, but the words wouldn't come. Tom took a step closer, his eyes never leaving mine. How long, Linda? he asked, his voice still calm, but there was an edge to it now, a barely contained fury that terrified me. I swallowed hard, forcing myself to meet his gaze. It was... it was just once, I whispered. It didn't mean anything. It was a mistake. Tom's jaw tightened, and he turned away from me, pacing across the kitchen. For a long moment, he didn't say anything. The silence stretched on, thick and heavy, until I thought I might suffocate under it. Finally, he stopped and faced me again, his expression cold. I don't care how many times it was, Linda. What matters is that you did it. You betrayed me. You betrayed us. I wanted to say something, to defend myself, but there was nothing I could say. He was right. I had betrayed him, and there was no excuse for it. I'm leaving, he said suddenly, his voice sharp and final. I can't stay here, not with you. Panic surged through me. Tom, please. He cut me off with a wave of his hand. Number, I'm done, Linda. You'll never see me again. But this, this isn't over for you. And with that, he walked out the door, leaving me standing there alone, with nothing but the weight of my guilt and the sound of the rain against the windows. Tom's departure hit me like a freight train. For the first few days, I was in shock. I went through the motions, waking up, eating, going to the gym. But it was as though I was moving through water, slow and heavy, everything muffled by the weight of his absence. The house felt empty without him, too big, too quiet— I found myself listening for the sound of his footsteps, the creak of the floorboards in the hall, but there was nothing, just silence. I didn't tell anyone at first, not the kids, not my friends. I didn't know what to say. How could I explain that Tom had walked out on me because of my own stupidity? How could I face the shame, the judgment? So I kept it to myself, hoping that he'd come back, that we could talk, that I could fix this somehow— but as the days turned into weeks, I realized he wasn't coming back. He didn't call. He didn't text. It was as though he had disappeared off the face of the earth. I tried calling his phone, but it went straight to voicemail every time. I left messages begging him to come home, to talk to me, but he never responded. That's when I started to panic. What if something had happened to him? What if he was hurt or worse? I called the police, but they couldn't do anything. Tom was a grown man, and there was no evidence that he was in any danger. They filed a report, but it was clear they didn't think it was anything serious. My panic grew when our children, Anna and Brian, called me, asking why they hadn't heard from their father. I tried to brush it off, telling them he was busy with work, that he was traveling, but I could hear the suspicion in their voices. They knew something was wrong, and I knew that sooner or later I would have to tell them the truth. When Anna arrived a week later, I knew I couldn't hide it any more. She walked into the house, her face drawn with worry. "'Mom, what's going on?' she asked, her voice tight with concern. "'Where's Dad?' I opened my mouth to respond, but no words came out. Instead, I burst into tears, the weight of everything crashing down on me all at once. Anna rushed to my side, wrapping her arms around me, and I collapsed into her embrace, sobbing like a child. I'm sorry, I whispered through my tears. I'm so, so sorry. Anna pulled back, her brow furrowed in confusion. Sorry for what, Mom? What happened? I wiped my eyes, trying to compose myself, but it was no use. The truth came spilling out, messy and raw. I told her about the affair, about Ryan, about Tom finding out and walking out. I told her everything. By the time I finished, Anna was staring at me, her face pale, her mouth set in a thin line. I don't believe this, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. How could you, Mom? How could you do that to Dad? I shook my head, unable to meet her eyes. I don't know, I admitted. I don't know what I was thinking. I made a mistake, and now, now he's gone. Anna stood up abruptly, pacing the room. 
Does Brian know? I shook my head again. Number I haven't told him. She let out a long, exasperated sigh, running a hand through her hair. You need to tell him, Mom. He deserves to know. I know, I said softly. I just... I didn't know how. Anna stopped pacing and looked at me, her expression hard. You need to figure it out, Mom. Because if Dad doesn't come back, we need to know what we're dealing with, and I need to know that you're going to be honest with us from now on. I nodded, swallowing the lump in my throat. I will. I promise she left shortly after that, her face still tight with anger and disappointment. I knew I had hurt her, just like I had hurt Tom, and now I had to face the consequences. Brian was less understanding when I finally told him. He called me from his home in Arizona, his voice filled with disbelief. You cheated on Dad? he asked, his tone incredulous. What the hell, Mom? How could you do something like that? I had no defense, no explanation that would make sense. I don't know, Brian. I wasn't thinking. I made a mistake. Well, yeah, no kidding, he snapped. What are you going to do now? I didn't have an answer for him. I didn't know what I was going to do. All I could do was wait and hope that Tom would come back, that we could somehow salvage what was left of our marriage. But deep down, I knew that was unlikely. I had crossed a line, and there was no going back. In the meantime, I had to deal with the fallout. Word spread quickly in our small town. People whispered behind my back, and I could feel their judgment every time I walked into the grocery store or the post office. Even my friends began to distance themselves from me, offering pitying glances and awkward excuses when I tried to reach out. The worst part was Ryan. He hadn't left town, and I saw him often at the gym. Every time I walked in, he'd flash that same charming smile as though nothing had changed. He tried to talk to me, to rekindle whatever spark we had, but I shut him down every time. I couldn't even look at him without feeling sick. I hated him for what had happened, but I hated myself even more. I was the one who had let things get out of control. I was the one who had made the choices that led to this disaster. And now I was paying the price. As the weeks went by, my life began to unravel in ways I couldn't have imagined. The initial shock of Tom's departure had faded, but in its place was a gnawing sense of dread that grew with each passing day. I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible was about to happen, that Tom's absence was only the beginning of a much larger storm. It started with the phone calls. At first, they were infrequent just a few times a week. The phone would ring, and when I answered, there would be silence on the other end. I thought it was a glitch, maybe a telemarketer's automated system gone wrong. But then the calls became more frequent. Every day, sometimes multiple times a day, the phone would ring, and no one would be there. It wasn't just the phone calls, either— I started receiving strange emails, messages with no subject line, filled with random strings of numbers and letters. I deleted them, assuming they were spam, but they kept coming. And then there were the notes. One morning, I found a small piece of paper tucked under the windshield wiper of my car. It was folded neatly, with no writing on the outside. I unfolded it, my heart racing as I read the words inside. I'm watching. My hands shook as I stared at the note, my mind racing. Who had left it? Was it Tom? Was he trying to scare me, to punish me for what I had done? Or was it someone else, someone who knew about the affair, about my betrayal? I tried to tell myself it was just a prank, a coincidence, but deep down, I knew better. This was deliberate. Someone was watching me, and they wanted me to know it. The paranoia started to consume me. I couldn't leave the house without feeling like I was being followed. Every time I stepped outside, I scanned the street, looking for any sign of someone watching from the shadows. At night, 
I double-checked all the locks, pulled the curtains tight, and lay in bed listening for any sound that might indicate someone was outside. My sleep became restless, filled with nightmares. I dreamed of Tom, standing at the foot of our bed, staring at me with cold, accusing eyes. I dreamed of Ryan, his charming smile twisting into something cruel as he whispered in my ear, reminding me of the night we spent together, and I dreamed of the house burning down around me, the flames licking at my skin as I stood there, unable to move, unable to escape. I couldn't talk to anyone about it. Anna and Brian had made it clear that they were still angry with me, and my friends had all but abandoned me. I was alone, trapped in my own personal hell, with no one to turn to for help. That's when Earl showed up. Earl had been Tom's best friend for as long as I could remember. They had served together in the military, and even after Tom retired, they stayed close. Earl was a no-nonsense kind of guy, gruff, straightforward, and fiercely loyal to Tom. When he knocked on my door one afternoon, I wasn't surprised to see him. I had been expecting him in a way. Linda, he said as I opened the door, his expression serious. We need to talk. I stepped aside to let him in, my stomach churning with anxiety. Earl had always intimidated me, but now, with Tom gone, he seemed even more imposing. He sat down at the kitchen table, his eyes scanning the room as though he were assessing the situation, looking for clues. I've been trying to reach Tom, he said, his voice gruff. He's not answering his phone. I swallowed hard, unsure of how much I should tell him. He... he left, I admitted, my voice barely above a whisper. Earl's eyes narrowed. What do you mean he left? I took a deep breath, forcing myself to meet his gaze. He found out about... about the affair. He walked out. I haven't seen or heard from him since. For a moment, Earl didn't say anything. He just sat there, staring at me with those cold, calculating eyes. I could tell he was piecing it all together, trying to make sense of what had happened. Finally, he spoke. Tom's not the type to just disappear, he said, his voice low and dangerous. You know that, Linda. Something's not right here. I nodded, my throat tight. I know, I whispered. I think... I think he's watching me. Earl's expression didn't change, but I could see the gears turning in his mind. He leaned back in his chair, crossing his arms over his chest. What makes you think that? I told him about the phone calls, the emails, the note on my car. As I spoke, I could see the concern growing in his eyes, though he tried to keep his face neutral. When I finished, he let out a long, slow breath. Tom's been in some deep stuff over the years, he said quietly. His work in security wasn't always above board. There are people out there who might have a reason to come after him, or you. My heart skipped a beat. What are you saying, Earl? Do you think someone's trying to hurt me because of Tom? Earl didn't answer right away. Instead, he stood up, pacing the length of the kitchen, his hands on his hips. Finally, he stopped and turned to face me. I don't know, he admitted. But we need to find Tom, before it's too late. It was Earl who first suggested that we go looking for Tom. He seemed convinced that Tom hadn't simply left because of my affair, but that something much larger was at play. I didn't know whether to believe him. Tom had never been one to talk about his work in detail, and over the years I had stopped asking questions, but now, faced with the possibility that he had disappeared for reasons beyond our broken marriage, I felt an unsettling mix of fear and hope. Fear that something terrible had happened to him, hope that maybe this wasn't all my fault. Earl and I started by retracing Tom's steps. We went through his things, his office, his files, his computer, looking for any clue as to where he might have gone. It felt invasive, like I was prying into parts of his life I had no business being in, but I told myself it was necessary. We needed answers. That's when we found it. 
Hidden in the back of his desk drawer, behind old receipts and paperwork, was a small worn notebook. The pages were filled with Tom's neat handwriting, detailing names, dates, and places that I didn't recognize. At first glance, it looked like a simple logbook, but as Earl read through it, his face grew more and more grim. This isn't good, he muttered, flipping through the pages. What is it? I asked, my heart racing. Earl glanced up at me, his expression serious. These names, they're people Tom worked with, dangerous people. I stared at him, confused. But Tom's work was in security. What does that have to do with dangerous people? Earl let out a long breath, closing the notebook and setting it down on the table. Tom wasn't just in security, Linda. He was involved in some high-level, off-the-books operations, things that weren't exactly legal. I felt a cold knot of fear tighten in my stomach. What kind of things? Earl hesitated for a moment before answering. Private contracts, black ops, stuff the government didn't want to get their hands dirty with. I sank into a chair, my head spinning. This was too much. I had always known that Tom's work was secretive, that he had been involved in some dangerous situations during his time in the military, but I had no idea it went this far. Why didn't he tell me, I whispered, more to myself than to Earl. He was protecting you, Earl said, his voice softening. The less you knew, the safer you were. I shook my head, disbelief washing over me. How could I have been married to this man for forty years and not known who he really was? How could I have been so blind? Earl continued flipping through the notebook, pausing at certain entries, his brow furrowed in concentration. After a while, he looked up at me again, his expression tense. There's a name here, he said slowly. A place in Montana. Could be where he's headed. Montana. It seemed so random, so far away from everything we had built together. But the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. Tom had always talked about wanting to get away from it all, to live off the grid, far from the chaos of the world. Maybe he had finally decided to do it, to disappear completely. Earl and I packed our bags and booked a flight to Montana the next day. I didn't tell Anna or Brian where I was going. I couldn't bear the thought of explaining it all to them, not yet. I needed to know the truth first. When we arrived in Montana, we rented a car and drove for hours through the vast, empty landscape. The mountains loomed in the distance, dark and foreboding, and the sky seemed to stretch on forever. It was beautiful in a way, but it also felt isolated, as though we were the only two people left in the world. The address in Tom's notebook led us to a small remote cabin nestled deep in the woods. The cabin looked abandoned at first glance. No car, no sign of life. But as we approached, I noticed the faintest wisp of smoke rising from the chimney. My heart pounded in my chest. Was Tom really here, after all this time? Earl knocked on the door, but there was no answer. He tried the handle, and to my surprise it opened easily. The cabin was sparse, just a few pieces of furniture, a bed, a table, a wood stove, but there were signs that someone had been living here recently. A half-empty cup of coffee sat on the table, and a stack of newspapers lay on the floor by the bed. Earl moved through the cabin, checking each room while I stood frozen in the doorway, my mind racing. If Tom had been here, where was he now? Had he left again, knowing we were coming? Earl emerged from the back room, holding a small box in his hands. Found this, he said, setting it down on the table. The box was old, the wood worn and cracked, and it was locked with a small metal latch. Earl pried it open with a knife, revealing a collection of photographs, letters, and documents. As I sifted through the papers, my heart sank. These were all things from Tom's past old military records, photos of him with men I didn't recognize, letters that hinted at operations I couldn't begin to understand. But there was one letter that stood out, 
It was newer, the paper crisp and unmarked by time. I unfolded it with shaking hands, my eyes scanning the words. Linda, if you're reading this, it means you've found me, or at least you've come close. I didn't want it to end this way, but I had no choice. My life has always been filled with secrets, things I couldn't tell you, things I couldn't explain. I knew you'd be hurt when I left, but I couldn't stay. Not after what I did, not after what you did. I've made too many enemies over the years, Linda. People who would do anything to hurt me. And now they know about you. They know about us. I had to disappear for your sake as much as mine. But know this, I'm not coming back. Not now. Not ever. This is my goodbye. You'll never see me again. But I'll always be watching. Tom. My hands shook as I read the letter again, trying to make sense of it. Tom hadn't left because of the affair, or at least not entirely. He had left because his past had finally caught up with him, and now I was caught in the middle of it all. The drive back from Montana was a blur. Earl didn't say much, and neither did I. There was nothing left to say. We had found what we were looking for, but the answers only raised more questions. Tom was gone, truly gone, and there was no way to bring him back. I thought about the letter constantly, replaying the words over and over in my mind. I'll always be watching. What did that mean? Was Tom still out there, somewhere, keeping an eye on me from the shadows? Or was it just a figure of speech, meant to haunt me with the memory of what I had lost? I didn't know. I wasn't sure I ever would. When we got back to town, I returned to the house, but it no longer felt like home. It felt like a tomb, filled with the ghosts of the past. Every room reminded me of Tom, his chair in the living room, his books on the shelves, the sound of his voice echoing in my mind. I couldn't stay there, not anymore. I called Anna and Brian and told them I was selling the house. They didn't ask why, they didn't need to. They knew as well as I did that this chapter of my life was over, and there was no going back. I moved into a small apartment on the other side of town, away from the memories that had weighed me down for so long. It was a modest place, just one bedroom, a tiny kitchen, and a view of the street below. But it was mine. It was a fresh start. For a while, things were quiet. The phone calls stopped, the strange emails disappeared, and there were no more notes on my car. I began to think that maybe, just maybe, I could move on. But then, one night, I found another letter. It was tucked under the door of my apartment, folded neatly in half just like the others. My hands trembled as I picked it up, my heart racing in my chest. I unfolded the paper slowly, dreading what I would find. Linda, I told you I'd always be watching. Don't forget that. Tom, I dropped the letter, my breath catching in my throat. He was still out there, watching, waiting, haunting me with his absence. I stood there, frozen, the letter lying on the floor at my feet. I didn't know what to do, didn't know how to escape the shadow that Tom had cast over my life. He was gone, but he wasn't really gone, not in the ways that mattered. I thought about calling Earl, about telling him what I had found, but I knew it wouldn't make a difference. Tom wasn't coming back, not in the way I wanted him to. He had made that clear, so I did the only thing I could. I locked the door, drew the curtains, and sat down in the dark, waiting, waiting for the next letter, the next reminder that Tom was still out there somewhere watching. And that's where I am now, sitting in the dark, alone with my thoughts, haunted by the choices I made and the man I lost. I don't know if I'll ever be free of him, of the memories, of the guilt, but I do know one thing. This isn't over, not by a long shot.